your Bibles to Acts chapter 14, if you will, please. Acts chapter 14. Brother Lawson, thanks for letting us come back one more time. We appreciate it. Yes, amen. Yes. All right, Acts chapter 14. <clears throat> and let's see, we'll start here. Uh, when I get in Paul's missionary journeys, I go berserk. Let's start with verse 21, shall we? Acts 14 and verse 21. All right, I want to speak to you tonight on the subject of when great men doubt. Acts chapter 14 and verse 21. Now, let me give you the background here before we pull the text out because most folks won't know what it is anyhow. Acts 14, 21. At this place in the 14th chapter of Acts, Paul has ended or is ending his first missionary journey. Journey number one is over. It started back over in the 13th chapter of Acts and it ends here in the 14th chapter. It is embraced in a total of 78 verses. It, the whole journey covered about 1,800 miles and took about three years. So when we read here in Acts 14, beginning with this passage, his first missionary journey is over, and you have the details about that first missionary journey. Now, as he ended his first journey, he was a very wise missionary. He backtracked to the churches that he had started, and he gathered together the leadership or converts or whosoever will out of those churches and got them together in what we might call a community or a common meeting of those people. And the missionary is going to leave the churches that he's established. And he's going back to the home church in Antioch that sent him out more or less three years ago. He's going back from where he started out about three years ago. The question is this. What will the missionary say to his churches as he leaves them? He knows good and well he may never pass that way again. However, he did pass that way one more time for sure in studying his journeys. Now, Mom and I can relate to this. We have been there. We have done that. We have said farewell and goodbye to many converts, not knowing if we would ever pass that way again, and we've never seen a lot of them again. They're already gone. So the big question we're looking at first is, what would the world's best missionaries say as he ended his first missionary journey and called his converts in and farewelled them? What last piece of advice, what instruction would he give these new converts still tottering as he left them not knowing if he'd meet them again in the service of God? What would he say to them? What would you say? What did we say? when we left our converts. Well, with that background in mind, now you know where the verse is coming from. Acts 14 and verse 21. And when they, that plural pronoun, Paul and his missionary team, and when they had preached the gospel to that city, that's the city Derby in the previous passage, to that city, and had taught many. Now I want to stop here and make a quick comment. Notice the balance in the apostolic and Paul way of doing missions. It said they preached and taught. They preached and taught. Now Paul just didn't preach, 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 or teach, 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 teach. And you've all heard the expression, and we've all heard it, that a church that has all preaching and all preaching and all preaching and no teaching will blow up. A church that has all teaching and all teaching and no preaching will dry up. But a church like Paul, the missionary, that has a balance between preaching and teaching, that church will grow up. It's inevitable. It has to go that way. So our missionary, in closing his journey, both preached and taught to the people as he farewelled them and worked his way back down to Atalia, where he caught the boat over to Seleucia, and then go up to Antioch. So and when they preached the gospel in that city and had taught many, they returned again. Note that, again to Lystra and Iconium and Antioch. Now they're doubling back where they had their most successful works, whatever's involved in that. All right, now you're doubling back missionaries. All the converts have heard, the word has gone ahead. The, the man who came and pointed us the way to heaven. Amen. 
yes, sir. will never be back again. Yes, sir, and everybody came. What would he tell them? What would he say to them? What would be his life's message? Here it is, confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them, disciples, converts, to continue in the faith. All right, missionary, what are you going to tell them? That we, through much tribulation, must enter into the kingdom of heaven or kingdom of God. It struck me years ago that the last thing that Paul would tell his young converts is simply this. Guys, you got to go to hell and back a lot of times before you finally arrive at heaven. That's a Pike translation there. In other words, the missionary told his converts, he didn't say, now look guys, always be it. They'd never heard of Wednesday night prayer meeting. Do you know when Wednesday night prayer meeting started? You need to know the history of it. Well, I know the, I have a message. It takes three hours to preach it. But I have a message on a good tradition. It started as a tradition. Wednesday night prayer meeting started right after the, the revivals, just before the Revolutionary War ended. And Paul didn't say go to Wednesday night prayer meeting. They never heard of it. Paul didn't say be sure you tithe. Be sure you be a good premillennialist. Paul didn't say that. Paul didn't say always read your Bible and send your kids to Christian school. The last thing the missionary said to his converts is simply this. I want to tell all of you something. That only when you arrive in heaven through much tribulation. That's how you're going to arrive in heaven. Now that sounds very alarming. We, we skirted and slouched in this direction this morning a little bit in the message. But I want to come back to it again tonight. The last thing the missionary said is, it is through much tribulation that you'll finally see the joys and glory of the wonderful place called heaven. Now let me make this clear and say one more time what I said this morning. I'm not talking about salvation by works. Rather, I'm talking about how salvation does work. As strange and curious and difficult as it is to understand, it still works this way. We, we, we don't hear this much anymore. That we are, Job said, man is born into trouble as sparks of a fire that fly upward. Amen. Isaiah said in 64 and verse 6, that we do all fade as a leaf and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. Our days are swifter than a weaver shuttle. I stood in the streets of Baghdad, Iraq in 1966 and watched an Iraqi woman ru running a weaving machine. And I saw every time the wheel made a turn, there was a pattern struck on the shuttle. Now from the weaver's side, it looks ugly and awful. But from the side that the weaver cannot see, the pattern is beautiful and exotic and most glorious. No wonder it is said in Job that our days are as a weaver's shuttle. You see, we only see the ugly side so often, the cloths, the rags, the untied part. But isn't it wonderful from, from that other side? The picture is right. You know, people, we, we look at things from the bottom side up. and They're rather messy, old chap, when you look at them that way. But I want to tell you, God Almighty looks at things from the top side down. And I'll tell you, they're quite nice, man, when you look at them from that side, the top side down. And here's our missionary saying in this great text here, saying this, Hey, people, I'm going. Oh, what's he going to tell us? They had bated breath. They had their tongue between their teeth. What's he going to say? He says, suffer, 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 and I'll see you in heaven when life is over. Goodbye. And the missionary left. What profound teaching. What truth we have forgotten about is wrapped up in these words. Now, with that, I want to take you to the 11th chapter of Matthew. And I want to show you what I believe is the most profound illustration in the New Testament of what happens when great men doubt this appointment that I've been talking about here for a few moments that we are born again into by the new birth 
It is ours, it is inevitable, and there's no escaping. Born into trouble when great men doubt. Do great men doubt? If you listen to the popular radio preachers, the majority of them, you're not supposed to doubt. We were in on furlough many years ago, and I was down in Bay Manette, Alabama, at Hand Avenue Baptist Church, Bay Manette. And I'd left there driving to Mobile. You know the big tunnel there in Mobile where you go through the other side of the city? And there was a famous radio, and he's a great preacher, this guy is. But brother, he just hadn't heard enough. That's his problem. When you heard a lot, you'll, you'll think different on things. And this famed radio preacher was really preaching away, and he said this. He said, now, folks, he said, he's in Dallas, Texas. I think he's left there now. He said, I want to tell you, he said, if you ever doubt God, said the minute you doubt God, you're no longer walking in faith. You've broken fellowship. Well, I just said to myself, well, Lord, I guess I live in broken fellowship most of the time then. I don't know what's going on. Amen. Now, you know, that was many, many years ago. We were still young people then, and that was a profound statement from a profound man. But looking back on it many years later, I learned now that the old boy just hasn't hurt enough to have good sense on these points and issues. Now, is it true that great men doubt? If they doubt, what happens to them? Some of you have been influenced by this lie, this doctrine of demons, that if you're sick and you take your medicine, you're not trusting God. Ever hear that? If you're sick, you know, you've had some jerk in the pulpit, brother, and hadn't had a bath in nine months, and he smelled, his preaching smells as bad as he's under his arms does, and you've had him preach, and then he's preached that business to you, and you've believed it. Well, I want to tell you, we've got to get our people out of this thing. We've got to bring them on a practical level. Listen, truth flies with two wings. One is all practical and common as cornbread and buttermilk, and the other is as mystic, mystical and deep and spiritual that it's almost unfathomable. And truth flies with these two wings, one all practical and one all spiritual. And the idea today that if I ever doubt God, then I'm not right with God. I want to tell you I've doubted God. I've been, my wife and I have been on the mission field. And tell you, you can doubt God, you can go to hell from the front seat of this church just as well as you can from the pub or the discotheque. Keep that in mind. So anybody can doubt God. And we've got to get ourselves out under this brow beat barrage, bumping billy goat trip that we've been on, that if you ever doubt God, then oh, you're not right with the Lord any longer. And God in heaven is mad, and he'll at least break one leg and maybe two because you've dared to doubt him. Now, I want to dispel that myth. Now, I'm not talking about doubting God when you're mad and full of sin and away from God and nobody can get along with you and you love sin and you love backslidden condition. I'm not talking about that. God might break all nine of your legs if you get in that state. I'm talking about when you're right with God, you're trying to walk with God, you're trying to do right. And let me, I a young man came around me this morning and told me, Brother Pike, this, that, and the other. And I grabbed him by him. I said, son, let me tell you something. There's one good thing in falling down. He said, what's that? I said, getting up. Yeah. Try it, buddy, and have a go at it. And it works that way. Right. We've got to understand that. So is it right that great men do not doubt God? Is it true that a man can be so close to God that he never doubts him? Well, I wonder. The best man that ever lived. When he was nailed on the cross, he was lifted up. And from his humanity, what did he pray? My God, my God, why hast thou, how dare you to lay sin at his door? Why hast thou forsaken me? That's the best man that ever lived. And that's the first of seven sayings and cries from the cross. Now we go to the 11th chapter of Matthew. And in the 11th chapter of Matthew, we're introduced to a man called John the Baptist or John Baptist. He's called both in Scripture. We're introduced to him. Now, let me give you just a little background so you won't just pull John out of a blue light special at Kmart and you'll understand where he's coming from. You've got to understand that when the Old Testament closed with the book of Malachi, Last book in the... Now, I know the Jewish Bible has a different arrangement, but the same books makes no difference. And when, when the Old Testament closed with the book of Malachi, 
When that book closed, then from Malachi to the appearing of John the Baptist in the, in the uh, book of Matthew, chapter 3, there's about 400 years, maybe add a little more than take a little, about 400-year period there between the end of the old and the beginning of the new. Now follow me very careful, and you'll understand why John the Baptist had such an impact and drew such massive crowds when he suddenly appeared on the scene preaching. Now from the closing of Malachi to the appearing of John the Baptist, the rabbis taught in the synagogues. The synagogue started just as Malachi closed. Now I believe this started with Moses, but this is what the textbook says. And so in the synagogues over that 400 years, the rabbis kept teaching, kept teaching the Jews, a next generation, next generation, and they kept telling their congregations, O oh, men and brethren of Israel, when Malachi closed his book, the Holy Spirit left Israel. And the Holy Spirit will never be back until Messiah comes and his forerunner appears. Now, think, brother, if you have the potential. When Malachi closed, the rabbis had preached for 400 years. The Holy Spirit left with the end of Malachi. Israel did not have the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit will only return to Israel when the forerunner introducing the Moshiach, the Messiah, appeared on the scene. Now, for 400 years, there's about 30-something generations of Jews who were born and died, born and died, born and died, born and died. We don't have the Holy Spirit. He hasn't come. What are we going to do? Let's look for the forerunner, the man that will introduce our Messiah to us. And finally, John appears on the scene. Now, one more thing. There had been no prophetic voice. There had been no God-filled prophet to appear to the nation of Israel from the time Malachi put a period at the end of Moses, at the end of his last word in his book, there had been no God-filled prophet for 400 years to arise and preach to the people. And for 400 years, the great nation of Israel did not have a prophetic voice, a man that could raise his hand and preach, and they knew God was on that man and with that man. But suddenly, after 400 years, there appeared a man who grew up in the wilderness of Judea. Now, the reason for that, God had him isolated so he would not be spoiled by the rotten Jewish system of that day, especially the system of the synagogue and of the temple under the corrupt leadership of a father-in-law, son-in-law, rascals, Annas and uh, Cephas running the temple. And suddenly John appears on the scene and John begins to preach. The word spreads like fire over Israel. And let me tell you, hundreds of thousands. I took a map one time and I found every city, every country, where it says people came from to hear John. And I found some of them came as far as 400 miles away, and it takes at least four weeks to make that trip. And when John suddenly appeared on the scene, there was hope, the sunrise of hope rose in Israel. And everybody said, the prophet is here. He's going to introduce our Messiah. And thousands upon thousands came out and heard that man preach. And brother did that man preach as they had never heard before. And he spoke. You know, John Baptist was filled with the Holy Spirit from his mother's womb. Now, Benny can't beat that one, can he? Benny can't beat that one. No, no, all you Benny fans. Ask him if he's got, oh, he'll cook up something, I'm telling you. He can't beat that one. And I hear Baptist preachers trying to explain that. Man, don't be stupid. Just, it, it means just what it says. I got a commentary at home and I read that. I read what a bunch. In fact, I tore the pages out unless my kids read them and get to see. Trying to explain the Greek word ek and out in Balo. I said, rubbish. I said, here's John Baptist and he was filled. His mother was filled with the Holy Spirit. And he was filled with the Holy Spirit before he was ever born. And for you, what does it mean? It means just what it says. If I say, I went home and ate a sweet potato, what does that mean? I took a bath? Huh? What does it mean? It means I went home and ate a sweet potato, man. That's exactly what it means. And John was filled with the Spirit from his mother's womb. Now, John drew, drew the crowds. God had a plan for John. The word of the Lord appeared to John in the wilderness. Brother, that's the, that's the memra for the Jews and the hologos for the Greeks. And the word of God appeared to John. It was the same word of God that it appeared to Abraham in Genesis 15 and verse 1, 2,000 years ago. And old Abraham got saved when God preached the gospel to him. There in Galatians 3, the Bible says. The word of God appeared to John. 
And God gave John his plan and his blueprint, but he didn't tell him all of it. He didn't tell him the whole story. And John went out and preached, and the crowds came. The Roman soldiers flocked out and said, Preacher, baptize us, not on your life. Stop beating up on people. Be content with your wages. They paid the Romans in bags of salt. That's where we get our expression, you're not worth your salt. Be content with the salt bag that we give you. In other words, here comes the tax collectors. Baptize us, not so until you stop beating people out of the money. Here comes the wealthy. Baptize, not so until you get one of those new suits and give it to a man who doesn't have one. What's he talking about? John is saying, I'm not going to baptize anybody until they demonstrate on the outside that they change first on the inside. Amen. That's exactly what he's saying there. Show me a change on the outside. Show me you don't beat people up. Show me you're not stealing and lying and cheating anymore. I wish some Baptist preachers would learn that. Well, they come down the aisle and they get the nervous breakdown before they get them in the water. And they get them in the water and stick them under there and six months later they wish you never laid eyes on them. A lot of them. Now, if you know, look, if you want to know what the first Baptist preacher did, brother, he checked them out. And if they didn't check out right on the outside, he knew they didn't have the good product, the real product, on the inside. Amen. And the masses came. Remember the time John stood and preached? Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. His father was a priest. Let me tell you, his parents died when he was young because they were old when he was born. John had to feign from himself. John had to struggle and grow up and battle and beat. Let me tell you, hard time is good for you. That's where you can lie and cheat and swindle and double deal and double cross is because you don't have any character. If you want something to build character, brother, ask God to make you hurt for about 20 years. And that will build some character in you and make something out of you, brother, that all hell can't move and change. And John had a big audience and a big crowd and was doing good. But something happened God hadn't told him about. One day, Herod's soldiers rolled up. That's Herod Antipas. The only man Jesus Christ ever spoke a bad word about was Herod, and he called him that what? Fox. Only man. What a lesson in that. I mean, what fox meant in their society, same as in the African society today. One day the soldiers rocked up. They chained John, took him over to the other side of the Dead Sea to a place called Macarus Prison. Josephus in his history tells you all about it. People come around me and say, Brother Andy, where do you get this stuff? I read. Simple answer. I read. If some of you turn the idiot box off, if some of you turn the vols off and the bulldogs and the polecats and, listen, and spend a little time reading. Well, I don't like to read. No, sir. It's quite obvious too, brother. I'm talking to you for five minutes. It's very obvious. I read. Get, go to the library. You don't have to. man said, I can't buy the book. You don't have to buy the book. Go to the library and check it out. Photocopy what you want. Give it back to him. You got it. All it costs you was photocopy material. My wife comes through my study. She says, my wife and I, we have a good time about our study. My study looks like, a, looks like Florida <laughs> when I haven't finished. Amen. I'm telling you. Amen. I got books stacked up and I'm talking to people. Yes. Oh, how are you doing all that? Yes. Yeah. Really? Got books stacked up. My wife, she said, why don't you clean this mess up? I says, honey, where no oxen are, the crib is clean. <laughs> Good, I tell her. I said, I don't come back and mess yours up. You leave mine alone. She come back and say, why don't you clean this place up? Now, you see, old John found himself in a place God had never told him about. He was enjoying the glory of being the prophet that Isaiah 40 and Malachi 3 and Malachi 4 predicted would prepare the way for the Moshiach and the Messiah. He knew that. He understood that. When he said Lamb of God, he went to that temple with his old dad as a little boy, and his old dad pointed out the symbolism many, a, many a time to his son. Because the angel had told him what his son was going to do, prepare the way for the Messiah. And John was basking in his glory. John was enjoying his ministry. And he was arrested and taken to Macarus Prison. Now, if you want to know what Macarus Prison is, I can give you an hour of dialogue. And I'm going to give you a uh, multum in Proverbs that say in Latin, I'm going to give you much in little. And here's what Macarus Prison was like Devil's Island. You ever read the paperback by Pompeian? I read it. I read it many, I read it 40 years ago. The only man ever escaped. You ever read about Alcatraz and all the hell in Alcatraz? Well, let me tell you, Macarus would make Devil's Island and Alcatraz look like a Sunday school picnic. Macarus is still there. There's a pit today carved out of stone where they dump the prisoners in with scorpions. The scorpions would sting but not kill them. You ever, you ever, how many of you have ever been finned by a catfish? I have as a boy. I fish the creek so many times. I got a scar today right there where a catfish fit. It hurts and hurts for mine hurt for a week after it was still hurting. The catfish shoots poison in when he fins you. That's the reason for that. And here's John. Suddenly his glory is departed. 
Suddenly this great preacher is in prison. And suddenly he finds himself in a situation that God had not told him about when he called him in the wilderness by the word of the Lord. There, listen, there are dimensions, there are parts of your life God hasn't told you about yet. Now listen to this. There are some of you, and there's a chapter in your life spelled C-A-N-C-E-R. That chapter's there. There's a chapter in your life, some of you, desertion. And you're going to find a little note on the table, I've had enough of it, I found somebody else, I'm gone. Listen, there are all kinds of parts of our lives we've not been told about yet. And that was true with this man. And John was thrown in prison. In Mac get, get your copy of Josephus with an index and look under Macarius and you can quick reference it. Don't have to spend 20 years reading the whole book. Isn't that the way you do it, preacher? That's the way a wise man does it. And read where the prison John was put in, Macarius prison. Look on, the, on a good marble map on the east of the Dead Sea, a solitary spot at the foot of the Moab Mountains. Now, our preacher's in prison. You know, suffering did something to this man. It made him change his opinion. Or he thought he did. Well, he wasn't sure. Because sorrow and suffering that had no answer and no reason scrambled him. And made him say what here was never intended down there. Now, some of you better hang on to that. Made him say up here. Right. Wasn't, wasn't intended down there. Now here's the story. John preached six months and baptized Christ. Then he preached for another year, was thrown in prison, and then was executed about nine months, ten months after that. Now John has been in prison about nine or ten months. He has been suffering unspeakable. He hears that the Lord Jesus is preaching nearby. So John calls in two of his disciples. He said, hey, fellas, well, let's read it, shall we? Look at Matthew chapter 11. Look at verse 2. Please, verse 2. <clears throat> now when John had heard in prison the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and said unto Jesus, Art thou he that should come, or do we look for another? What? Amen. What are you saying? Hey, have you lost your marbles? Have you gone mad? He called in, we'll call him Bill and Tom. He said, Bill and Tom said, I know it sounds awful, fellas, but I said, can't handle it. He said, just go ask him, is he really the Christ or have I missed it? I wonder what those two men thought. Amen. Those two men left that prison. They went galloping off over the Jordan River where Jesus was preaching near Aeon, according to his chronology of his life at this time. And the big crowds were gathering and they stepped up. Well, let's see what happened, shall we? Look at the next verse. Verse 4. And Jesus answered and said unto them, this is the two men that came to ask, had John really messed it up and had the story right? Now you notice what Christ says. Christ says, go and show John again. I got again circled in my Bible. Yes. Brother Charles, I don't know how many times the Lord has come and had to show me again. Yes. And again. Yes. And I get up and preach and say, well, I got it preaching. I'm not going to do this. And I have to be showed again. Yes. And again. And again, it says here, and show John again those things which you do see and hear. What? Here's the signs of the Messiah. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised again, and the poor have the gospel preached unto them. Blessed is a man that doesn't get mad or is not offended at me. Now, the two, Tom and Bill, came around and Jesus says, you go tell John that I'm performing the signs that the rabbis have said that Messiah should perform. I'm the Messiah. I qualify according to the signs. Go tell them that. Spread the news. Now, when the two men left, the Lord Jesus turned to the crowds. The crowds heard the question, and I'm sure somebody must have said, oh, did you hear what John said? I know these people heard John preach because Jesus said, did you go out, what'd you, when you went to see him, did you see him shaking as a reed? They'd heard him preach a year and a half ago. Yes, sir. And when these two men ran in and everybody got quiet, and every, you know, everybody listens, they're sticky beakers, they say in Australia, they got the ease drip on everybody's conversation. And the men said, well, Lord, John don't know if you're the Messiah or not. He, John, John, look, he's a scrambled in that prison. He don't know what he's talking about anymore. Are you the Messiah? That's all he wants to know. 
And here's the crowd. What? What's it? What? You? What? Yeah. What? What's this? What's this? What? He's a great man. Something happened to him. He's not making sense anymore. And when the crowds left, when the two men left the crowds, Jesus turns to the people. Now here it is. Then Jesus begins to defend John to the crowds. Defend John? You know, it's a blessing that John did not belong to the average independent, old-fashioned, fundamental, non-compromising, and full of baloney Baptist church. That's right. It's a blessing John didn't belong to that kind of Baptist. You know what the deacons would have done? Did you hear what John said? Let's God, let's have a business meeting. Let's have a business meeting. Let's, let's, let's nail him to the wall. That right? Yeah. Yoo-hoo! Hello! Yeah. That right? In fact, some of you birds are sitting here who would do that very thing. Come on, preacher. Some of you sitting here tonight. You do the look you look as pious as the Pope when he's sober. He's not sober very much anyway, incidentally. Some of you sitting there would do that very thing. You're so non-compromising, and God's so lucky to have you to run his bandwagon. I don't know how he ever made it without you before you ever got born in this world, anyhow. I want to tell you there's a lot of sides to the Christian faith, brother, that we're not introduced to until we get so old and worn out. We can't do anything but believe them and drag on through to heaven when life is finished then. Christ turned to the crowds. All right, Jesus, the crowds listen. Now, everybody must have said, boy, hold on. The old man grabbed his son and said, son, hang on. Jesus is going to let John have it. Here it comes. I'm sure he was a pastor of the local independent, fundamental, non-compromising Baptist church. I'm sure he must have been. Now, notice what Christ said here. Verse 7, as they departed, Jesus began to say to the multitudes concerning John, what went you out into, so that proves they'd heard him preach on the first occasion. What went you out of the wilderness for to see? A reed shaken with the wind? He said, when you saw John preach, was he down there a little, as J. Harold Smith used to say, wheezy, feezy, pussy, foot and nimby, pamby, messing around. Was he that, you know, so nice, he stinks, you know, afraid he'll insult the devil. Was John that kind of man? They said, no, man, he wasn't that kind of fellow. He said, those Pharisees left there smoking when he got through with them. They were burning all over. He wasn't that kind of man. And, and listen to the next thing he said. Next verse, verse 9. But what went you out for to see? A prophet? Yeah. Jesus said, oh, no. He said, I say unto you more than a prophet. And then in verse 10, Christ quotes from the passage from Malachi that predicted John was coming. And then in verse 11, verily I say unto you, among them, here's Christ's opinion of John. Here's Christ's opinion of a man who's denied everything he's ever said. Here's Christ's opinion of a man who's talking stupid. But you see, Christ knows that hurting changes people. Christ knows that hurting will make you say things you wouldn't say when you're normal. He knows that. We don't know that. We condemn them and run them down and beat them up and chew them up and spit them out. What did the Savior say? Amen. The crowds rocked back. Oh, boy. Hold your shield up. Here it comes. Boy, here it comes, all right. Verse 11. Verily I say to you, among them that are born of women, there hath not risen a greater than John Baptist. Amen. Great men doubt. Honey, you better believe they doubt. Christ said he's the greatest man that's ever been born among women and he deserved that place because he was the one who introduced the Messiah to the nation of Israel and the world. He's the greatest man ever. But you see, suffering did something to him. Heartache did something to him. When we first went to Australia in 1966, we finally settled in a fishing village called Gladstone in the province of Queensland. Queensland is the size of Texas three times. Takes you three days to drive from the north border to the south border of Queensland. Three days. Now, we started our work in Gladstone, Queensland. Gladstone at that time had a population of about 6,000 people. Today there's nearly 50,000. They discovered bauxite, basic substance for making alum aluminum. What do we call it? <laughs> aluminum. For making aluminum. All right? So we started our work in Gladstone. We'd been there going, I got my wife settled, got the kids in school. We were, we were sitting on orange crates and apple boxes. We had atheist Greek neighbors on this side. And we had Roman Catholic neighbors on that side. We had a man on the other side that tr tried to push me down the steps about two years later, a year and a half later, across the street over there. Now, we're trying to get settled in. The word spreads all over a small village. There's Americans come to town. Now, this was the post-war generation. 
the old Australian men that had fought the Japanese during the Second World War were alive. And let me tell you, those Australian men, they hated Americans with a passion. During the Second World War, there were 500,000 American soldiers stationed in Queensland. And do you know what most of them did? They chased the Australian women and their women, the men's wives and their daughters. And the Australians hated the Americans. Now, when they got on the battlefield, they would die for one another. When they got back home, they fought in the pub and cut one another with broken beer bottles and knives and razors. And we landed. And that, that generation's dead and gone now. Dead and gone. And we landed in that generation there in Gladstone, that fishing village. We'd been going about nine months, and there was a knock on my door one day. And I went to the door, and there was an old, old man named Eric Jones. They had a hospital on the hill. You call it a barn. They call it a hospital. And they had a boiler room where they heated the rooms. In the it gets cold over there in the wintertime, too, incidentally. And Mr. Jones was in charge of the boiler room. Now, I'm talking about an illustration what suffering will do to a good man. That's what I'm after. I don't care anything about Australians in boiler rooms. I'm telling you what it's going to do to some of you. And, hey, you better, you better swallow your spit and get ready for it because it's coming. Now, Eric Jones belonged to the Plymouth Brethren. Now, they're not a bad group, brother. The real ones are not. We've had a lot of dealing with them. And Eric came to my house and said, Mr. Pike, I, I, I rented an article. It had one little old village newspaper, and I went down to the Roman Catholic editor and assigned a contract to keep my article there. We had a Roman Catholic priest saved through that article, that newspaper. And I signed the contracts. I knew she'd stop it if I didn't for one year. And Eric Jones came to my house. He said, I've been reading the article. He said, we got a dance hall down here, the gym dance hall. I'm going to rent that dance hall. He said, he said, if I try to get people in, will you preach to them? I said, Eric, I'll do it. Now, that's how we got started over there in that thing. Now, we were there, worked there, finished the work there, shifted out in the desert, 2,400 miles away, out in the Gibson Desert, into Alice Springs and started the second work, left there, came home on furlough, went back and went back on the coast and started the Maranatha Bible School. And, of course, being away and then coming back many years later, you ask about people. Uh, we went back to Gladstone many years later, back to that church. Many years later, Faith Baptist Church, first independent Baptist church ever started in Australia. Today, there's almost 200 of them. Now, we wish the earth would open up and swallow about 50 of them. Really, I'm, I don't mean the people. You know, just get them out of there because they're crazy. But as a rule, most of them are doing a good work. Now, many, many years later, we went back. And they had a little, went back to the church and had a little bench we set up front. The people come around, we'd talk to them. And boy, what a time. What a time of reminiscing. And I asked somebody, in fact, Eric's son, Bruce, was there. And I said, Bruce, what happened to your dad? Now listen to this. He and his wife are always very close. They would sit, old people, why did it? Sitting in church still holding hands. Hugging and smooching and kissing in the car. Why did it old people? Most of them are cussing and fighting today. When they, you know, when they, really? It is different. And here's what Bruce told me. He said, Brother Pike, my mother died with a heart attack. I said, how'd your dad, dad handle it? Now listen. He said, he didn't. He lost his mind. He said, last week he was in the pub so drunk, the pub is the beer joint, they phoned me to come and bring him home. He lost his mind. And the last account I had, the old man had died. He died raving mad. You say, preacher, how does all that figure out? I don't know. I, look, I don't want to know. But everybody talking about they got all the answers, all the answers. These answer guys don't even know usually what the questions are in the first place. Look, people, you don't know what's going to happen to you before you leave this world. Now, you young people, you got beautiful young ladies and strong young men here. And let me tell you, all you young ladies, listen, you, 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 you highly prize the beauty, young lady, you highly prize the beauty of young womanhood for the glory of God. You keep yourself for the glory of God. Young men, you use your strength and all the vigor and zeal of young manhood to be spent for Jesus of Nazareth. Don't you get out in these discotheques and sticking needles in your arm and brother hung up on this uh, uh, porn. You can get hung on porn and become demon possessed by it. Listen, you make your mind up if you have to walk. They, they brought a young couple to my house here some time ago, and the young woman was crying, I'll never get married, never get married, never get married. I told her, I said, honey, you're better off to walk a lonesome road the next 50 years instead of 20 years down the road and five husbands and 10 kids later, brother. And your life is messed up, and you don't know what to do. Amen. Eric Jones completely lost it. 
you don't know what's going to happen to your life. Amen. You don't know. You might end up with Alzheimer's and next year, brother, be as nutty as a fruitcake and not even know you're in this world and beating up on your wife. Great men doubt. Great men can be devastated by circumstances they've had nothing to do with. And we need to understand that. And we need to know that as Baptists who are supposed to believe the word of God. We've heard this rubbish preached and rubbish preached. If you're right with God, you'll always be all right. Are you crazy? Brother, you're going to get see now. You don't know what's going to happen. There's a family up in the church in Kentucky named Edens. The old Sarge Edens. Great friend. And he was telling me about his uh, father-in-law out here uh, other side of Oak Ridge. He'd been a West Virginia coal miner. Saw a short, stocky, stout man. Where, you remember that old Petitus, that black lung disease? Been in those mines up there and got out and retired and had his wife and kids back up there on the other side of Oak Ridge there in the hills. He liked the hill country. And he came down with Alzheimer's. Big, stout man, just as meek. Cry over things, help little kids. And he got Alzheimer's. And he got mean. And they put him in the hospital and had to tie him to the bed. He was throwing those doctors and nurses around like a shoe. Just pitching them around. They'd bring the big ones in. He'd pitch them all and pitch them all. And, and listen, the old man died like that. Ronald Reagan had Alzheimer's. It reversed him. He died peaceful and quiet. Listen, you don't know what's going to come in your life. And some of you guys, you think you're so smart, you wipe your dirty feet on your wife all day long. You've never thanked her for a thing she's done. Oh, crap, and some of you young people, you're too stinking lazy to pick your dirty clothes up off the floor. You pile the dirty dishes up in the sink. That's a wife's job. She ought to kick your tail. Amen. Amen. I'm telling you, brother. Amen. That's preaching, brother. Come on. And that's not T-A-L-E either, brother. That's, right. that's what ought to be done. We're living, everybody's got, we got to have a macho man. Right, macho. Right. I spend as much time at the sink washing dishes for Amen. my wife, and I'm proud of it, brother. Amen. I can't do much to him. I call mom 15 to 20. Can I help? Yes, you can do this. And I'm glad to help. But that's how we got to live as Christians. Some of you are brought up like savages, and you're going to die a savage. Hey, you need to ask God to repent and ask God to, catch, to pull those blood-sucking Cedar Creek leeches out of your feet. And get them away from you. You don't know. There are people sitting here tonight. And in five years you're going to be as loony as loony tunes. There's some of you sitting here tonight. And let me tell you. Your daughter's going to come in and say. Dad I'm pregnant. What are you going to do then mate? Huh? Bless God. I'll handle it. I'll tell you what you're going to do. You're going to be like everybody else. And say oh God life is finished. I can't handle it any longer. Hey, we're not as smart as we think we are. You're not as tough as you. You let God. There's old Donnie back there. Get, talk to him about cancer. And let it, talk to me about cancer. Talk to me about heart attack. We've had both of them to roar in our home. We know what they can do to people. And listen, I don't care. You can go around with a 90-pound Bible tucked under your arm and strut your stuff. You're not going to. You don't know what you're going to do. I mean, you might end up, brother, a raving lunatic throwing doctors and nurses around out of this world, don't know where you are. Then what? Then what? Great men doubt. Great men go down. It's not something that we can't. It's not something. That wasn't because that Shirley Eden's old coal miner father was a sinner. It affected his mentality, his mental function, and he couldn't help it. I don't know how I'm going to end. I know I'm going to end. And I know I can see the end down the road. I'm telling you, I can see the end down the road. I mean physical. I'm going down and down and down. And I, look, it, it's, it's looking mean down there. And in 10 years, you might say, well, I hear Brother Randy is in, a, in, in an institution in Greenville. Let's go visit him. And you come to visit Brother Randy, and there's an old man sitting on the bed. Like that. Hi, Brother Andy. Who are you? Get out of here. I'll break your neck. I'll wrap this crutch around your stupid head. Get out of here. They say that. And you're going to leave there and say, poor Brother Randy, had he been right with God. Are you mad? Are you nuts? Let me tell you, Brother. Brother Gary, I might end up with Alzheimer's and think I'm a pigeon. Who 
blew it on a roost pole. And you come in there and I'm sitting on the bed going, whoo, 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 whoo. Now, if that's so, when you leave there, you say, poor Brother Randy, he's insane. But his soul yes, is 100%. Yes, yes. Yes. Right, right. His soul is 100%. Yes. He's as nutty as they make him on the outside. But on the inside, man, he's a jewel. Yes. Woo. On the inside, he's washing the blood. Yes. On the inside, the Holy Ghost is dwelling. Yes. So, though he's as screwball, 100% on the outside, yes. that old boy is A-OK -okay yes. on the inside. Yes. Man, thank God. Thank God a hundred times, son. That's how that thing works. So you don't have to go around here sucking your thumb and, and borrowing sorrow from tomorrow and worried about next month's troubles and taking Valium about what's going to happen next year. You don't have to do that, brother. Look, if you go nuts, that's all right. Let them go nuts. The inside never go nuts. It's been born of the Spirit of God. It cannot sin. The Holy Spirit lives. It is as perfect as God is perfect. That's so weird. Is that right? Amen. I mean, brother, you might end up crazier than me. <laughs> Wouldn't it be something if they locked both of us up in the same room? <laughs> They'd have to feed us with a pole, wouldn't they? <laughs> Wouldn't that be so? We don't know. But the lesson is, is great men doubt. And when they doubt and can't help it, and it's not because of sin, it's because of whatever has struck their body and tearing the function system of humanity down. That's all right, brother. You can't do anything about it. That's all right. Just go nuts and go nuts happy. Amen, just, just fade out and fade out happy. Yes. And remember, one of these days, yes, oh boy, one of these yes, nights, yes, yes, that old man's going to look up and say, who are you? He said, I'm Gabriel. Yes, I've come to get you, boy. Let's go. Yes. That's right. Yes, and you know what I'm going to say? Let's go, Gabe. You're running late, son. Let's go. Out here. Now, folks, that's how it works. That's the truth. You don't know what's coming. You don't know. Your husband might leave you tonight. You don't know. I know you say, well, I pray I do this, brother. I pray as much as any of you. And, brother, I've had everything to happen in my life but an airplane to crash on my house. I better shut up. I might have one. We don't know what's going to happen. I mean, just about everything. You don't know. What are we going to do? We got to walk meekly and humbly and trust God. What few things we can understand, we understand them. Most of them we don't understand. I've quit. My wife and I, we have all kind of talks about things. She said, what are we going to do about this? I said, I don't know what we're going to do. What are we going to do about this problem over here? I don't know what we're going to say. What are we going to do? I don't know what we're going to do. We're going to serve God. That's what we're yeah. going to do. Yeah. She said, somebody needs some help. Get some money out of the bank and give it to them. What are we going to do? I don't know. We're going to serve God. That's what we're going to do. Amen. Brother, that's how you have to live the Christian life. Amen. There's no other way. Amen. And let me tell you, some of you tight, wide, skin flinch, you wouldn't give God Almighty air if he was hung in a jug. Amen. That's where we are today in the church. Well, people, great men do doubt. Elijah got under the juniper tree, and boy, did he read his Sunday school lesson backwards. Hmm? The book of Job starts off, the, the only man in the Bible God gave a character reference of is Job. Only man. Nobody else. There's over 800, well, 1,800 characters mentioned in the Bible by name. So Lockyer said. Only man, great man, man of evil, perfect, upright, feared God, eschewed evil. And you get to the last chapter of Job, Job's down the dirt and says, oh God, I repent. That's right, yeah. Isn't that great? The greatest man ever lived, he ended up repenting. He got out at the end of the road and God got through with him. Now look, people, great men do doubt. You say you're, you're a pessimist, you're preaching doom. You can call it peanut butter and bananas. Amen. I've told you the truth. Amen. And I didn't get this out of the latest last hundred outlines, but Dr. Bottle Stopper, I got this from being a man 72 years old. Hallelujah. I got this from spending half my life on the mission field, raising kids going to hell and back, brother, day after day after day after day. I've gotten that car many times in South Africa, knew I'd never see my family again. We've been through that over and over and over and over and over. We were in the own furlough back in 76, sleeping in a little old house trailer, and the telephone rung about 3 o'clock in the morning, and a man with an obvious Greek accent said, we're going to kill you when you go to Petersburg, Virginia in the morning. And I was going to Petersburg, Virginia in the morning. Now, I've learned and said, you know, that made me so mad. If I'd have had him in my hands, brother, he'd, he'd have wished he'd have been in Athens. And so you know what I learned to do? I learned I can whistle. I'm a country boy. 
You can hear me whistle for four miles. So I took the telephone and I let him have one. <laughs> and I guess he's still walking around like that. <laughs> you know, that's what you got to do these guys. Now, people, some of you need to get right with God. Like, you know what? Some of you men need to go back to your wife and apologize for being such a pig. Some of you women need to apologize. Some of you women won't shut up for five minutes and give your husband a chance. Now, I'm not being funny. You got to run your mouth. Why don't you do that? Why don't more money? Blah, 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 blah. This. And look, hey, why don't you shut up and give him a chance? Huh? Huh? Is that right or wrong? And some of you young people, hey, guys, you need to go to your dad and apologize for what you've done. I've told you this before. When I used to travel out, I'd be in these homes and I'd hear the preacher's wife talking through the bedroom wall. Oh, wow. You could write a bestseller on that one. <laughs> no kidding. I was up in a place called um, Somerville, Kentucky, staying in a little old train. I heard the pastor and his wife talking through the wall. I left the next morning. I left the next morning. His son was on my side. And he moved the car for me. When I got in the car and drove off, it did, look, I didn't have any money, didn't know what to do. To go, and I flicked the key and out fell a $20 bill. His son was on my side. It, a row broke out in the church there in, in, in uh, Somerville, Kentucky. Listen, folk, we don't know what's next. That's right. You young people, you need to get right with God. You young men, listen, some of you young ladies, you're wearing pantyhose now, you're grown up. Oh, you're getting on high heels. You're learning to wiggle anyway on them. You're wearing high heels. Listen, young lady, while your mother's alive and still got her mind, you need to go hug her and say, Mom, I want to thank you for washing my dirty clothes. That's right, brother. That's right. That's right. You need to do that. That's right. When I told my dad goodbye, I won my dad to the Lord in my ordination service. I won my dad to the Lord. My dad was a poor new truck driver, was an orphan. Twelve years old, got him out of orphan home and got an old Civil War veteran, mean old German named Trevor. Used to beat him, make him sleep in the barn. My dad told me the only friend I ever had was my old tomcat named Garpenter. And I won my dad to the Lord. When I went to the, to the nursing home, Tennessee nursing home, there uh, on Tennessee Avenue in Murfreesboro, Tennessee, I hugged him. I sat down beside him on the bed, and I pulled him, and that old face wrinkled. I'm beginning to look like my old double chin getting squishy under here, you know. My old dad there, and face all dropped down. I hugged him up. I said, Dad, I hope you understand. I love you. I appreciate everything you've ever done for me. And all he could say was, oh, 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 oh. I don't know what they meant. And you know when my sister phoned me three years later and said, Randall, father died. I wouldn't take a million for that farewell. Now look, that's where some of you are. We need to do some business tonight in this church. Let's stand and pray, shall we?